So um, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a propitious day um, uh, to have uh, Professor Wolf join us. Um, um, we, we've talked a lot uh, in our earlier session uh, around the election, around uh, social divides and health divides. And um, Professor Wolf, as I, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if he was in the room or not, so he doesn't know if it's true or not. But I actually said that uh, if there's somebody who's actually written the proverbial book on social divides and health divides, it's him. Um, so um, let me just do the formal bio, and then I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit off the bio. So uh, Steve Wolf is uh, the director of the VCU Center on Society and Health, um, which has been established since 2007. He's a professor of family medicine and population health at VCU, and has had a long career in, um, on both evidence-based medicine, development of evidence-based clinical guidelines, and a focus on preventive medicine and social justice. He um, has published studies that look at poverty, education, causes of racial ethnic disparities, and uh, really pointing the way to um, policy solutions to a lot of these factors. And he has uh, bridged the worlds of uh, population health and clinical medicine very well. Uh, Steve is trained initially as a physician um, uh, from Emory University with an MPH from Hopkins. That's the formal bio. Uh, and the other formal part of the bio is that he has um, been awarded important awards by all the right organizations and is a member of all the right clubs. Um, uh, but uh, leaving that aside for a second, um, um, you know, there are very few people who um, I have admired for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, I remember when I started my career, uh, when uh, uh, you know, you also look at, at uh, people who see what they're doing. I always thought, like, you know, there's this guy, Steve Wolf. Like, if only I could ever write things like him. And uh, I've never really quite gotten there. But uh, it's uh, I have admired uh, Professor Wolf's uh, output for a really long time. I think he has written some of the most uh, important, interesting, and influential papers that about how social divides become health divides in this country for the past, over the past two decades. And uh, it's really an honor having him here. Steve, welcome. Thank you for that amazing introduction, especially from someone, I feel the same way, Sandra, in terms of uh, wishing I could write the way you do. Uh, so <laughs> it's a mutual admiration society. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, Boston has actually got a, a strong connection to my family. My, my parents uh, grew up in Dorchester back in the 30s and 40s, so it's, it's neat to be uh, in, in the area. Um, I wanted to start out by simply uh, dealing with the reality of today. Um, it, I, I uh, don't know how many of you have had, a, had the misfortune of experiencing a death in the family, and I'll try to be bipartisan and say have had the joy of having a child born, um, and then the next day try to go to work and pretend like nothing special has happened. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to just go on with your day. Um, and and we, I did get a chance to attend part of the afternoon event, which I found therapeutic just to be able to be with people who share the same feelings and, and so forth. Um, Unfortunately, the events of last night happened after I prepared my slides. So I, I sat on the plane uh, trying to think of what last minute adjustments uh, I needed to make and I realized uh, it's, it's too late to try. So bear in mind that these slides um, uh, are not informed by the uh, most recent events, but I will uh, pause at a few points along the way. I think I won't be able to resist the temptation to say a word or two about putting it in the context of, of what we're dealing with. So uh, the good life. Later on in the talk, I'll, I'll explain that I've stolen this concept from Jim Marks, the vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, but what I want to start out with doing is uh, just to establish three propositions. Um, the first is that health in the United States is worse than in other high-income countries. Uh, and I'll, I'll review some data to defend that claim. The other two I, I don't think are particularly newsworthy here in this kind of an audience. Um, the fact that uh, for generations, uh, low-income Americans, people of color, uh, have suffered from uh, health disadvantages. Um, another, though, that I hope to um, uh, try to uh, emphasize is the fact that these generic differences, that these health divides, as Sandra put it, um, that exist across our population also exist across our geography, um, uh, in, in, all, almost down to the neighborhood level and the census tract level, as I will try to clarify. Um, we live in a society where that's not the perception. So if, if I were to say um, that uh, 
the uh, health of Americans is worse than in other high-income countries, as I've had to say to reporters in uh, press events when uh, the report I'm about to tell you about was released, there is a bit of a, of a puzzled look on people's faces because there's a sense that we have the best healthcare system in the world. We have the Mayo Clinic, we have Boston University, we have major academic medical centers with the best technology, the best doctors, and so forth. So the notion that uh, our healthcare system is inferior to that of other countries is already uh, difficult for people to accept, but even those who understand its limitations uh, still think, they still cling to the idea that the health of Americans must be better than for people in other countries. But the idea that uh, uh, all those advances in our healthcare capacity uh, don't really do much to improve our health is something that's pretty straightforward to those of us who uh, exist in, in environments like this where we understand socio-ecological frameworks. This is the World Health Organization's conceptual model for health. I love showing this one to my uh, medical colleagues because usually you can't see the font in the back of the auditorium. Um, but I can point to that there's a little box here called health system um, to give them a little bit of humility about uh, how much importance uh, that has. Unfortunately, in our society, we have you know, $2.8 trillion a year going into that little box there and not enough resource going to the other areas, as I'll, I'll mention later. And you may be familiar with this uh, diagram from the county health rankings that, uh, in a more simplified way, uh, tries to clarify that our health is shaped to some degree by health care, but very much by our behaviors, by our environment, by public policies, uh, and so forth. So um, I had the opportunity, the pleasure really, to chair a panel, a National Research Council Institute of Medicine panel that published this report in 2013. Uh, the report's called Shorter Lives, Poorer Health, and uh, I think the title pretty much sums up the findings very well. Um, we were charged by the NIH, of all uh, funders, to uh, compare the health of Americans with people in other high-income countries. We had to choose, uh, we had to compare with 16 other high-income countries, um, and they included uh, Canada, a uh, number of European countries, Japan, and so forth. And what we found was, was frankly sobering. Uh, we went into it knowing that Life expectancy in the United States tends to be lower than in these other countries. But as I'll explain in a second, it goes beyond life expectancy. Uh, this here is uh, the data for life expectancy. And you can see that for males, uh, we definitely have the lowest life expectancy. And for females, the second to lowest life expectancy uh, in the country, uh, in, in, in the high income world, that is. But when you drill down, which is part of the exercise our panel went through to try to uh, as the demographers say, do a decomposition analysis and understand what are the causes of death that are driving this, um, you find that it is a very pervasive problem across um, a very diverse set of conditions. Uh, I don't know if your eyesight is as bad as mine, but if you can't read this, let me just tell you that this part of the table down here are the conditions or the causes of death where Americans have equal or lower mortality rates than in the OECD countries, so that's a shorter list. Um, and then this longer list at the top are all the different conditions where Americans experience higher mortality rates. And if you can look more closely, what you would see is that they run the gamut from traditional chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease to injury fatalities to perinatal conditions and so forth. Enough diversity that if you were on our panel, which uh, was the dilemma we were faced with, and trying to think about, well, what's driving this? It became very obvious right away with charts like this that we don't have a magic bullet, and I hesitate to use that phrase, but we couldn't just say, well, it's guns, uh, and that's why Americans have poor health, or it's obesity. Um, it was so many different conditions with have very different pathophysiologic processes that it became very fascinating to think about what's driving this. The other thing we wanted to make sure we weren't uh, mistaking is whether this was some quirk of a particular year, uh, a particular year's data that we were looking at. And so we wanted to look at the temporal trends. And what you see in this slide here um, are plots that show in the red dots the life expectancy for uh, Americans, and the other gray dots are the comparison countries, the peer countries. And what you'll notice, if you were going back to 1980 here, that back then, uh, U.S. life expectancy was a little below average, but uh, not terrible compared to the other high-income countries. And then over time, you see a clear trend where we have gradually slipped to the lowest uh, part of the ranking. But here's the more, uh, well, 
before I get to that next slide, I want to point out this one here, which is, I talked to the students about this earlier today. We were trying to also explore the question of whether this mortality disadvantage that Americans have has something to do with a particular age group. Like maybe it's, we have terrible infant mortality rates, and maybe that's what's driving it. Um, or maybe it's middle-aged Americans dying at high rates from diabetes. Well, by doing this age stratification, we were able to show that for every age group, uh, beginning at infancy all the way up, we had a consistent problem uh, across the life course where um, mortality rates were much higher in the United States than in the other countries. We were at the bottom of the ranking until you get to age 75. Um, which, you know, I said facetiously, if you make it to age 75, you're, it's great to be here in the United States. But uh, short of that, uh, not, not such a good situation. But here's the other slide I was mentioning earlier. So this is not looking at uh, life expectancy um, in general, newborn life expectancy. It's instead the probability of survival to age 50. Here on the left, you have males. Same pattern you see where we're at the bottom and then it gets progressively worse. But look at females. Started out in 1980 at the bottom of the distribution, and then over time have completely gone off the charts. So in other words, what you're seeing here is that the probability of a woman surviving to age 50 is lowest if it's an American woman. So this is a very striking problem. And I can show you a similar slide we had for other subgroups in our country. For example, the probability of a child surviving to age five is lowest if it's an American child. Um, Concepts that I don't think are well understood or familiar to the American public. So we know that uh, from reports like that, that Americans' health is worse than in other high-income countries. When we came out with the report, uh, there was this reaction from politicians on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, you know, this notion of American exceptionalism resists the idea of comparing us to Sweden or Finland or Japan. Um, and there is a bit of a pushback that, well, those are very homogeneous populations. They're not like America. We're different. And so we uh, were encouraged by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to do a follow-up study uh, called the Health of the States, where we're sort of turning inward and looking domestically at, uh, at health patterns within the country. And when you do that, you see that our health varies by geography. So here's an example of looking at uh, life expectancy by state. But you can keep zooming in uh, geographically. The, the unit of analysis can get progressively more granular, and you continue to see the same phenomenon, that there are health disparities the closer you look. So here's an analysis that we did in, Cal in the state of California, where we looked at uh, life expectancy by census tract, and you can see, again, rich diversity in uh, the amount of uh, years a newborn can expect to live in the state of California. And then when you get down to the metro level, uh, you can identify differences in life expectancy across small distances. This is uh, one of a set of maps that we have developed over the years um, with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that uses this concept of small distances, uh, uh, you know, large differences in life expectancy across small distances as a way of helping uh, communities understand that they have big health divides that exist within their neighborhoods. Um, and, it, and, you know, this is not a new concept in social epidemiology. This is something we've known about for many years. But this has been an intentional effort to l do a better job of communicating this kind of evidence to the public and to the media in ways that are engaging. So, for example, this is our metro uh, Washington, D.C. map where, I don't know if you're familiar with the Washington metro, but it's like the T, and, and using subway stops as landmarks help people to understand uh, the differences in life expectancy uh, that exist within cities. This is a stylized map. The more traditional uh, ArcGIS maps that you are familiar with, uh, here's an example where we did it in Chicago, allow you to see with rich detail the deep differences in life expectancy, for example, between Southside Chicago and, and other parts of town. So uh, I come from uh, Northern Virginia, the suburbs of Washington, D.C. You may have heard about us last night on the news. Um, we did our best. Um, and um, uh, it's an area that's pretty affluent. If you look at the annual reports that come out for counties with the highest median household income, there's two counties in our area, Fairfax and Loudoun County, which also were mentioned uh, in the news last night, um, that typically rank among the most affluent counties. And so on the county health rankings, they vie for number one and number two for the state. And there is a general perception among 
local officials and the media and so forth that this is a very well-off area and that everybody is in good health. And we purposely use that particular setting to try to um, uh, dis dis disabuse them of that notion by making this more granular assessment of differences in life expectancy. So here in Fairfax County, uh, an area that's uh, uh, relatively affluent with good outcomes, when you examine by census tract, you again see big disparities that exist in health outcomes. And in this particular report that we did uh, in Northern Virginia, we were able to zoom in and show how neighborhoods that are literally on the other side of an interstate um, at the same exit have big differences in life expectancy uh, shown at the bottom are the differences in life expectancy, but more, t more importantly to the right, the demographic differences that exist between these neighborhoods that are uh, uh, important drivers of those differences in health. And, you know, I'm using life expectancy as an example. We could talk about infant mortality or diabetes rates or ACEs and any number of other health outcomes and you'd find the same phenomenon. So why? Uh, reporters ask me this. Why do we see these big differences in, in life expectancy uh, across these neighborhoods? Uh, many of the important factors are shown here. Uh, education and income, in, in, a, in essence socioeconomic status, are probably the most famous factors that, that drive this. Um, but there are a number of other conditions in our environment, housing, access to healthy foods, the built environment that allows people to be physically active the design of our cities, whether uh, we have uh, highways that close off neighborhoods and socially isolate them, whether there's been residential segregation um, that has also created uh, discriminatory social isolation, uh, infrastructure like transit systems that allow for people to uh, access good jobs, uh, good doctors, childcare, and so forth. All of these things contribute uh, to these disparities that exist uh, across out outcomes. Uh, History has a lot to do with why these conditions exist. They didn't happen by accident. It's not a random event that these uh, differences exist by neighborhood. Um, how many of you are familiar with redlining? Okay, good. So uh, I don't need to re uh, uh, explain that uh, in great detail, but this map here, and you can do this for many cities. I'm sure you can do it here in Boston as well. This happens to be Richmond, Virginia, where our university is located, where you can look at the redlining map on the left from the 1930s and our life expectancy maps for uh, current modern-day Richmond and see this uh, close mirroring between the neighborhoods that were identified back in, in those original uh, uh, planning around home loans uh, to uh, isolate people of color um, and the now, what are now known as bad neighborhoods, uh, where there is concentrations of poverty, uh, persistent poverty, um, limited educational attainment, uh, violent crime, and also poor health, as shown in this particular set of slides. So, um, I, Dr. Galea I mentioned that I have a medical background, and in, and in the healthcare setting, um, there historically, at least when I got my training, uh, was not a lot of emphasis on the social determinants of health. Um, uh, how many of you are, are physicians? Okay, so you may, and you're probably of the uh, age group that you can remember this, when you used to do a, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that wasn't said very nicely. Uh, um, but uh, when we would do a history and physical on a, on a on a paper form before the EMRs came around, there was usually a little box there that said social. You, there's lots of room for the history of present illness, chief complaints, review of systems. There's a little box called social. And in there you basically wrote, it had enough space to write positive tobacco or negative tobacco. And that's about all you could fit in there. But at least in principle, there was a recognition that social conditions uh, mattered to health. But in, in modern day healthcare, I think there is a real move now to uh, recognize the, the greater importance of these factors in shaping health outcomes. Increasingly, um, the healthcare community is recognizing the need to go outside the walls of the clinic and the hospital. Um, you know, we often complain in healthcare about readmissions or bounce backs where you take care of a patient, you admit them for congestive heart failure or diabetes, you tune them up and then you send them home and then they're back in the ER a week later. But it makes sense. You're sending them right back into the environment that made them sick in the first place. So increasingly, uh, the healthcare system is thinking about what can we do in the community setting, in the outpatient setting, to address some of these conditions so that we um, reduce the likelihood of, of this overutilization of healthcare. 
So when you think outside of the healthcare setting, well, what are, what are some of the obvious uh, factors that we can be thinking about? The first ones that are typically mentioned by us in public health are the built environment, whether there's places for people to exercise, where, where children can play, uh, parks and green space and so forth, uh, access to healthy foods on the one hand, and conversely, the density of fast food outlets, liquor stores, uh, bodegas and so forth that don't necessarily offer the healthiest food choices. And that's important. But we also know that it goes beyond those decisions about sidewalks and, uh, and grocery stores to a whole set of policy issues that uh, are, are major factors in, in shaping our health. Um, and that gave rise to this term health in all policies, which I don't know if many of you are familiar with this, but it's, it's been a, a bit of a buzzword in public health circles for a decade or so. The notion that policymakers in municipal government, state government, federal government, and so forth, should be thinking about the health implications of lots of policies that they make, not just those about Medicare and Medicaid and, uh, and health care provision or even public health services, transportation policy, should we uh, widen the highway, uh, should we add a new exit, um, land use decisions, zoning decisions, which affect not only the placement of those fast food restaurants and the parks, but a lot of other uh, factors that affect our health. Uh, tax policy, uh, saying taxing cigarettes or excise taxes on unhealthy products. Um, housing, agriculture, environmental justice, I can, I can go on. There's a number of uh, different slides that are uh, different uh, policy domains that are too lengthy to fit onto one slide. But the notion is that these other policies matter greatly to health. Uh, part of the work of the center that I direct um, is aimed at trying to bring this message to policymakers. Uh, so the people that are actually making these decisions uh, and the media, for example, and the public don't necessarily think of these particular issues as health policies. Uh, we have a, a tendency in our society to silo these things. And so there's a section of the newspaper that um, is about health care and Affordable Care Act and so forth, and then you flip two or three pages later. I'm showing my age because I'm talking about flipping a newspaper. Um, <laughs> You click a few buttons and you're now in a different uh, section talking about education or uh, labor policy and so forth. And that, that compartmentalization or fragmentation exists in our, in our legislatures. So on Capitol Hill or in state government, you have one committee that's dealing with education reform. You have another committee in a different part of the uh, legislature that's dealing with other issues. But part of what we do is try to come to these policymakers with greater information to help them, as we say, connect the dots and understand how these choices that they're making not only affect housing or affect transportation or affect the environment, but affect health and health care costs as well, something that they, they do care about in other contexts. So we do have this problem of silos, and getting over that is, is, is really challenging and problematic. A couple examples of, of work we've done that I'm sharing with you here one is the uh, education and health initiative. So this was an attempt to try to help people who are working in the education space. So these are the folks who are thinking about education reform. How do we improve high school graduation rates? How do we advance educational attainment? Uh, understand the health implications of education and conversely help people in the medical space and, and healthcare fields to understand how important education is to the diseases they're trying to treat. Um, now, you know, in a school of public health like this, you'll find many uh, sources of data like the ones I'm going to show you. I'm just going to give you a few examples of the gradient that exists, the socioeconomic gradient that exists for any number of health outcomes. Here we're so showing self-reported health, and you can see this clear stepwise pattern where people with limited education uh, are much more likely to report fair or poor health. If you drill down and look at actual prevalence rates for these diseases, you find the same pattern. So shown here are a bunch of major diseases that afflict Americans, especially with the chronic disease burden that's growing in the United States with the current demographic shifts and so forth. And so these diseases are a big deal to the healthcare community, uh, for, for doctors who, uh, and other healthcare professionals who are trying to treat these diseases. They're a big deal to, um, to employers because a lot of their workforce is suffering from these conditions. They're a big deal to the insurance industry and so forth. Well, if you care about these diseases, you should pay attention to this gradient because what you can clearly see is that people with a limited education have a much higher rate of, of uh, experiencing these diseases. Uh, 
the, the probability of a middle-aged American dying from diabetes is three times higher if they've had some college education, if they have had not graduated from high school than if they have some college education. Those kinds of differences are, are substantial and important in, in uh, thinking about what the drivers of health are. It should be said that the relationship between these social determinants and health are complicated. Uh, and this is a schematic we developed for public, uh, for the general public to try to unpack some of those complexities. What's shown here is how there's this one pathway where education increases your social and economic resources that allow you to uh, obtain resources for better health. So it might be that through, an edu through your education, because we live in a knowledge economy, you can get better jobs. And that allows you to have health insurance coverage and to get a higher salary, and that allows you to live in a healthier neighborhood and so forth. There's the reverse causality, uh, which is the notion that, say, students who are in better health can experience better success in school. So think of a child with asthma or ADHD. Uh, better health gets you better education. But the really interesting and important area is this green box at the bottom, the contextual factors. because. Uh, those actually have the ability, they in effect function as confounding variables where they have an important influence not only on your success in education but on your health as well. So imagine a child growing up in a uh, family struggling with divorce or living in a rough neighborhood where there's a lot of violence and, and uh, other stressors in, in their neighborhood. Uh, those child suffering from the consequences of toxic stress and so forth are not going to do well in school, so they're going to have a poor uh, pathway in terms of their educational trajectory, and the stress that they're experiencing is more likely to induce a bunch of adverse health consequences. Some of it through direct biologic mechanisms. We now know a lot about the role of stress on the body of the child, on brain development and so forth. Uh, we suspect that those stresses cause them to adopt unhealthier coping behaviors, such as smoking and drug abuse and so forth. Um, and those end organ effects have actually been shown, and ACEs have been shown, adverse childhood experiences, to increase your risk of developing adult diseases. So you end up with a higher probability of poor health and a higher probability of educational uh, or limited educational attainment. And ipso facto, you've got a correlation here, but the root cause is that early childhood experience that they grew up with. So those contextual factors are actually pretty important. So. A little bit of a touching on current events here. Um, we have been noticing in the last two or three years a pattern where uh, people with limited education uh, are experiencing a much more dramatic change in their mortality outcomes. This is the study that Jay Olshansky published uh, back in 2012. It seems like it just came out, but uh, it looks like a few years have gone by since then. Um, but that was a pretty important paper in health affairs because what he was showing is that in general life expectancy is increasing in the United States as it is in most high income countries. But for people who have not completed high school, we see the reverse pattern, that life expectancy uh, is decreasing. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second uh, and I'll try to draw the connection to current events then. I talked to you for a few minutes now about education and health. You can do the same thing with income and health. And it makes sense, because especially in, a, in today's knowledge economy, education and income are very closely interrelated with each other. But here you, again, you see the same gradient, where you see uh, that people with uh, higher incomes have a le lower likelihood of reporting fear or poor health. I don't know how many of you saw uh, the study in, uh, the, in April in JAMA uh, looking at uh, the gradient in life expectancy by income. Uh, in the United States, uh, classic work. What you see is that all along the income ladder, I mean, it's a no-brainer that people living in poverty have poor health, but all along the income ladder, uh, you have this phenomenon where people are experiencing poorer health than people with higher levels of income. And it, and it occurs for not just the poor and the near poor, but also for people in the middle class, and even people who would be considered the upper middle class are having poorer health outcomes than those in the uh, top 1%. Um, so we are coming out of a presidential campaign season where we have seen on both sides of the aisle large rallies by involving people who are frustrated over income inequality and this widening gradient. The widening income gap is something that's been pretty dramatic over the past 
number of years. And with that has come a widening health gap uh, between those uh, in the top 1% and so forth, the more affluent folks, uh, and those who are part of that collapsing middle class, um, and as well as the uh, growing number of people in poverty. There have been health consequences along with economic uh, consequences from that trend. Not surprisingly, along with physical health complications from uh, economic marginalization comes psychosocial consequences. Um, so uh, again, a bit of a no-brainer that people with uh, lower incomes have more stress uh, and more depression uh, than those with higher levels of income. But it's a, it's a, it seems like a no-brainer, but it's sometimes forgotten in the current policy debates about mental illness. So if there's a shooting and suddenly there's more attention about mental illness, there is a failure to recognize the fact that some of our social and economic policies may have something to do with this, along with all the inadequacies in our treatment for mental health care, mental health services, and so forth. That the larger environment, uh, policy environment that we've created in this country, may be a contributing factor. So I mentioned the J. L. Shansky study. There have actually been a few of these, but one that actually got a fair amount of press attention occurred last year. It was published by uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton. Angus Deaton is a Nobel Prize winning economist from Princeton. They published a study that ended up getting picked up by the New York Times and got a lot of coverage showing that for middle-aged white Americans, uh, death rates are rising. Um, and the causes of death that were identified in that study included fatal drug overdoses, um, depression, uh, suicide, uh, cirrhosis, uh, that's related to liver diseases and so forth. The sense being that this rise in mortality rates uh, has something to do with um, what, uh, what you know, some elected officials called an epidemic of pain, uh, both uh, physical and psychic pain, uh, potentially. Uh, sometimes you have to get a little distance from a situation to, to get it in perspective. So this is the Guardian newspaper in the UK looking at these results from the US. And I thought quite accurately portrayed this as, as a phenomenon that reflected what they called a ruthless economy. And the, if you read the story, what it goes on to talk about, I think quite incisively, is that the white middle class that are experiencing this rising mortality rate um, used to be, uh, in my parents' generation, uh, a population that uh, had some stability in their lives. They could go to work for the local factory. They could plan on working there most of their career. They could count on earning enough money to uh, buy a house, raise their kids, send their kids off to school, have, have some money left over for retirement. That whole infrastructure has collapsed uh, under our current economy with the loss of manufacturing jobs and so forth. So we've experienced this economic collapse of the middle class. Um, that has resulted in um, greater financial despair and, and other symptoms. Um, and here I will digress a bit about current events to point out, uh, uh, we were having a conversation earlier this afternoon, a Washington Post story that came out during the campaign looking at mortality rates for states that were supporting Donald Trump. They were noting, of course, that his popularity was buoyed by the uh, you know, white voters with limited education and linked up this data from the epidemiologic literature about the rising mortality rates to actually ask the question, how do death rates compare between Trump voters versus uh, other voters? And predictably enough, now that you've thought about this evidence, uh, the, the study found that uh, they indeed are experiencing higher death rates, uh, probably from the very socioeconomic conditions that we're talking about. So we've talked about education and income. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about place. So we now know so much more about how our health is shaped, not only by what degree we have or how much money is in our wallet, but also uh, what neighborhood we live in. So you can be rich, um, you can have a big bank account and have a fancy degree, but if you're living in a neighborhood where your kids are inhale inhaling polluted air and they have asthma, um, or there's gun violence, or there's inadequate transportation and so forth, there are going to be health consequences for you that your degree and salary won't protect you from. Place matters a lot, and that's really what stimulated our work to try to convey this to the public. Uh, I mentioned the metro map for D.C. that we've developed. We've actually done this for 25 different cities and rural areas around the country. 
uh, Boston is one of them. Um, and they all show the, basically the same thing, that there are these dramatic differences in life expectancy, expectancy, sometimes 15, 20, 25 years difference in life expectancy between uh, neighborhoods. But here's a sort of poignant example. This is Miami, Florida, and you can see a difference between a, a life expectancy of 86 years and 71 years in very nearby areas. In the Miami Herald, when it covered it, uh, I thought it was helpful. They, they had this carousel that was running on the newspaper where they showed this. This is the image over here in Key Biscayne where the highest life expectancy exists. And then just a short distance over in Overton, which is where the lower life expectancy exists, it looks like this. And you got the same thing going on here in Boston. It's true in Chicago, many other cities around the country, that you have, within a very short space, uh, these dramatic differences uh, in health outcomes. Um, so it's very important that we um, contextualize this around current events, because those dramatic differences in life expectancy that exist in those neighborhoods um, mirror other important differences that exist in those neighborhoods. Um, I once did a, a presentation in, in, in the House of Representatives where I was showing some of this data, and Congressman Bobby Scott, who's a Democratic uh, congressman who represents the district where my university is, um, posed what was basically a rhetorical question. He said, you've shown these maps of where the neighborhoods are with the poor health. If you were to map where the high crime rates are, where would it be? Uh, if you were to map uh, where, you know, our greatest uh, costs in social services are, where would it be? And of course, you know, the answer was in the same neighborhoods. He actually made the argument that we'd be more effective if we didn't just talk about health, but actually tallied up all the costs that exist in those neighborhoods. It'd be a more effective way for him to convince other members of Congress uh, about the value of investing in, in strategies to address those problems in those neighborhoods. But the concentration of these problems among communities of color um, is something that I think, and we, you brought up race in the afternoon's discussion, it's, it's essential to confront. Um, because not only is this something that is accentuated in, the, in current events, but the history of it is part of, of the current context. The fact that this has been a persistent problem in these neighborhoods that have uh, become home to concentrated poverty and other disadvantage because of public policy decisions that were made generations ago intentionally, uh, in, in many cases, uh, to uh, isolate these neighborhoods and uh, in, in, in leading in, inevitably to their economic uh, marginalization and social isolation. So I want to get done in time so we have a little bit of chance for discussion. So where does this leave uh, the policymaker? So I've had this slide for a while. Uh, those of you who follow politics will know some of the senators in here are no longer in Congress. Um, I used to show this slide to talk about how do you present data to policymakers in a way that uh, reaches them. Um, the thing I'm struggling with right now after uh, what we've just been through is, is now we have an even higher order problem, which is how do you, how do you deal with elected officials who aren't really looking for data? Um, who, aren't, who aren't persuaded by evidence, who um, aren't necessarily concerned about facts, uh, who are shaping policy around uh, not just ideology but emotions. Um, that's, that's a challenge. And I think with what the dean pointed out earlier today about our need to get better at communication uh, really underscores a real challenge we have in public health, which is we have to get really skilled at the kind of marketing and messaging techniques that the business world has mastered. Um, in, and we have to use that, those types of approaches in public health to reach these audiences. Um, you have to sort of uh, meet them where they're at and find the issues that are really important to them rather than the ones that are important to us. Once you link into the issues that are important to them, then you can back in the issues that are important to us. So take this example here. Uh, an argument that we were using in our education and health initiative. Every state govern, every governor has to balance the budget. And the challenge all states are facing is how do you balance the budget with rising Medicaid costs? Medicaid costs that are rising so dramatically that it eats into your budget for education. That's why state university support has fallen so much. Helping them to sort of 
you know, start with that centerpiece, which is something they understand very well, and think about the connections between education and health and how cutting funding for education could potentially shoot them in the foot by driving up health care costs and thus Medicaid expenditures is really important. This is uh, from a study done by Elizabeth Bradley at Yale University. I don't know how many of you have seen this, where she looked at the relationship between social spending and health spending in different countries. So what, what you see here is the higher ratio means a country that spends more on social spending than health spending. The, the countries with the, the bars that are going above the horizontal dotted line turn out to be countries with much longer life expectancy and lower disease rates than the United States. And this stubby bar here is us, the United States. And the reason we have that short bar is because we spend disproportionately on health care. It's not that we're not spending a lot of money. We spend more per capita on health care than in any country in the world. None actually come close to us. Uh, it's just that we're concentrating it all in health care and spending very little on social services. So we end up spending all that money on health care, and our population actually dies earlier and has higher disease rates. So there's something phenomenally illogical about that. Well, there's lots that we could talk about during the discussion period about why it's that way. There's a lot of profit centers that come from spending so much on health care and so forth. But there's also political ideology that stands in the way of investments in these social services. And I think in the wake of the change in leadership that we experienced yesterday, uh, there is an increasing threat to those kinds of investments, uh, which ultimately means uh, there will be health consequences, along with all the other um, socioeconomic consequences. So sometimes I think we need to start thinking about what other stakeholders we can reach out to. I, I would say, based on where things have been going in the last few years, culminating uh, with last night, that the federal government is not going to be the answer. Um, and that there are other stakeholders that I think have a vested interest in seeing, uh, uh, in paying attention to these social determinants of health. One are, one is corporate America. Employers are losing their shirts on health care costs, and many of them now are actually writing papers and, uh, and having meetings about social determinants of health because they've done the math and they're starting to see the implications of this. And on the left, you can see the, the, the different ways where a sicker population threatens the business community. It affects corporate uh, produ productivity. It affects competitiveness in an international marketplace. Those disease rates that are shown in the table here, in this case arrayed by education, have huge economic implications for these companies. So if corporate America starts becoming interested in addressing these things, the politicians may follow. The financial community is now interested in this. I don't know how many of you have been following what's been going on in the work of the Federal Reserve Bank, which is now talking about social determinants of health and discussing the role those uh, health threats are playing to the U.S. economy. Um, the Federal Reserve Board has been coordinating an effort with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to pay more attention to community development and other strategies for, that can not only promote economic development but improve health. These are covers of different publications that have come out on this very issue. So you have bankers, investors, social impact bonds thinking about their role in addressing health. Then you've got the healthcare community. The Affordable Care Act and other reforms that are making healthcare systems accountable for population health outcomes have forced them to start thinking about what is their role in helping to improve the health of communities? This is a cover of a report from Kaiser Permanente. But there are other major health systems that are taking large amounts of their revenue and investing it in the community because, again, they've done the math in their boardrooms and have decided that this is very important to them in terms of uh, dealing with their bottom line. This is an example uh, from Camden, New Jersey, uh, where Jeff Brenner you know, did a study that got a lot of attention uh, suggesting that 50% of ER admissions uh, could be prevented by dealing with unstable housing. So many healthcare systems are trying to set up systems in place in their clinics, in their emergency departments, in their hospitals to provide social workers, case managers, and others to help their patients uh, deal with these uh, social services. So I promised you I'd get back to why I entitled this talk, The Good Life. Uh, shown on this picture is Jim Marks. So he's the executive vice president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, an old friend of mine, used to be at the CDC. 
and here he is, you know, in the leadership role for the biggest foundation in, in, in healthcare. And he gave a talk on two different occasions. I was in the audience, and I heard him say this, that people don't care about health, which is a funny thing for someone with his background to say. He said, people don't care about health. They care about living a good life. And health is, a, is one of the important ways for having that good life, but they want to be able to attend their granddaughter's wedding. They want to be able to travel. They want to be able to see their kids have a better future than they did. And if we step back for a second and take a broader perspective, I think we have an opportunity to be more effective than just thinking of ourselves in the public health box. Um, and I hesitate to say that at a school of public health, but I really think this is where the future lies, is starting to broaden our horizons a little bit. So this is the famous New Yorker cover, you know, and I hope I haven't offended any New Yorkers here, but this, this notion that we see the world from a particular lens uh, and we, we think that's the way the rest of the world looks. So the term health in all policies, which I used earlier, uh, is in a way a bit of a narcissistic term because we say health in all policies because we think all, every policymaker should be thinking about health issues. But you could be saying uh, clean energy in all policies. You could be saying children in all policies. Depending on where you're coming from, uh, there are a number of different potential issues that should be considered in policies. So really what we ought to be thinking about is how do we make policies that improve our overall well-being and help Americans generally achieve a good life, health being one of those features. So um, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with the Charlie Brown Christmas special, but this reminds me of my uh, Charlie, it's my drawing, I'm not an artist, okay? So this is like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. But uh, the purpose of this uh, schematic here is imagine that you have a tree where the canopy of the tree represents this overall well-being, this o overall notion of, of well-being. And imagine that each of these branches represent different sectors. So health would be one of them, but also it could be education, it could be housing, it could be criminal justice. I often feel like we're all operating in our little branch, and most of us are at this distal end of the branch, and we talk about equity and, and divides. Every one of those sectors right now is talking about the divide. So for us in healthcare, it's, hey, we've got differences in health outcomes by race and ethnicity. The criminal justice people are over in their branch saying, we have injustice in uh, incarceration rates and police treatment of uh, suspected criminals. And the people in housing are saying, we have unfair, unfair housing policies. Um, so we need to deal with that, unfair banking, loan, uh, unfair uh, lending policies, and so forth. If you ask any one of pe the people working in these areas of social justice, what, should we be doing something else more upstream, more in the way of the root causes? Um, what would you point to? So yeah, we'll, we'll come up with these Band-Aid solutions for the unfair lending and some Band-Aid solutions for the unfair housing and Band-Aid solutions for the healthcare disparities. But they all will start pointing to the same root causes. So if this, uh, if this trunk of the tree represents opportunity uh, and the threats to opportunity, that exist across social classes or across race and ethnicity in our country, dealing with those core issues is going to make improvements across all those sectors. And the beauty of thinking of it in that more holistic way, rather than within our particular domain, is that you can make a more effective policy argument with it, even down to the level of return on investment. So when we were first doing our education and health initiative, we were trying to make the argument with policymakers that the money you save on health care by investing in education will pay for the cost of education. But if you think about it, that's just looking at this one part of the diagram at 7 o'clock, that improved education improves health. But really, improved education affects a lot of things. And all of those can be monetized. So if you to tally up the, the net economic benefit across all those domains, then you come to the congressman or uh, city council or whatever with a far more effective return on investment to argue because the totality of those benefits are so large. The other beauty of this is now you are able to enlist partners in the initiative. It's not just uh, the education and health community. It's people working in criminal justice. It's people interested in economic development. And so we're moving toward a world where 
we're thinking about cross-sector collaborations to achieve collective impact rather than one particular entity doing it alone. So you're in a school of public health. In the old days, the idea was the public health department would do this. Um, or maybe a school of public health would do it. But what we're seeing now is a movement at the community level uh, where people are working across sectors around developing uh, initiatives in the community. At this point in time, it's getting, I'm getting a little cynical, but I feel like the federal, the federal government and national policy is the least, uh, least primed at this point for innovation. State, some states are doing, and Massachusetts included among them, uh, are doing innovative work, but I think the most cutting edge innovations are happening at the community level. This is the website of the Build Healthy Places Network. Um, it's a website that, it's a network that's been created because there are so many examples of communities doing this that they've had to create a network to keep track of it all. And a general feature of all of these is this notion of cross-sector collaboration to achieve collective impact. This is my poster child for it, which is in San Diego, Live Well San Diego, an initiative where you have uh, multiple sectors working together around a set of defined goals. So they have been explicit in, in defining what exactly are the objectives they're trying to improve. They have a well-branded uh, 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 design template for sort of explaining this. This chart appears on the wall of all the offices of the nearly 200 partner organizations that are working in San Diego toward this. So they proudly display in a frame on their office the goals that they have set as part of Live Well San Diego. And they've created metrics and data dashboards so that they as a community can actually track their baseline and chart their progress across short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So this is getting serious about uh, evidence-based uh, policy development. We are entering an era of big data where we actually have the potential to merge large data sets across multiple sectors where communities can make really sophisticated choices uh, about policy options. Um, I'm going to skip through this, uh, it's this new study that we just released looking at the health of the states, but uh, end with uh, this example, again from San Diego, this is me actually standing in front of this gigantic display screen which has the uh, city of San Diego, the county of San Diego behind me, but what's really important about this uh, image is not me or the screen, but these people here. These are community members sitting at tables where they have uh, keyboards and, and a mouse and their own screen where they have access to a data tool that we've created that allows them to interrogate lo local data sets down to the census tract level to zoom in on particular neighborhoods in their community and start asking questions about which of those factors are driving health outcomes and how they might prioritize different uh, policies in their community to address them. So my last slide is, is my picture of the symphony. The, the, the thing about m music, like a symphony orchestra, you, you don't get that music unless you have all of these musicians all there together, each bringing their particular talent. So there's you know, the guy with the viola and, and so forth, all there together, and the conductor, which is effectively like the backbone organization in a, in a collective impact initiative. The problem we have in so many uh, past attempts that haven't been so successful is you have the guy with the bassoon coming by himself and saying, I'm going to improve population health. Um, or maybe he'll team up with the kettle drum, and, but you don't get music that way. Uh, for us to actually be successful in transformational change in population health, you need this rich cross-sector collaboration to shape all the different factors in our daily environment that affect health and then you start moving the needle. So I'll stop there because I want to leave time. Maybe there's not enough time now because it's already 5.30, but thank you very much for your time.
and appropriate pain, asking how could anybody deal with those people? When in reality, based on that slide, which is an accurate suggestion, those people are, are our people in a very important and fundamental way. Uh, and we need to figure out how to make that connection real again. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I, I think, um, I mean, any of you who are working on the opioid crisis and so forth, that's the population where we're, we're seeing a lot of this happen. The difficulty is, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. First of all, just focusing on the white uh, middle class voter that we're currently focused on, um, is that the the solution that would be recommended based on the data, based on what we know about about social epidemiology, is that there needs to be an investment in um, the economic mobility and, and growth of that population to deal with their uh, improving their marketable job skills, improving their educational attainment, to give them the kind of resources to attain better health all of which points to the need for an investment in the middle class, for tax policies that would promote this. And the, the elected official that they went for is not necessarily going in that direction. So that's sort of a paradox that you have. Um, the second, though, is that if, if I were to show you some of the graphs that have been presented, like Ann Case, the co-author of the Case and Deaton study, got into a lot of trouble when she showed uh, at, a, at a meeting that I attended um, a temporal graph showing the rising mortality rates for whites and didn't have African-American mortality rates on the chart at all because if she did, the y-axis would go way up to the ceiling of the auditorium um, because it is so much higher than those white mortality rates. Uh, there was, in a sense, there was an interesting Q&A about the degree of racism in how that issue of the rising mortality rates in whites is discussed when we're actually talking about uh, a problem that has existed for generations at a much higher level for people of color and, and uh, low-income populations. And, and policies that would uh, address those more vulnerable populations than the white middle class are potentially in real jeopardy given the, the change in government that we're about to confront. So, I mean, I totally agree with you. I, I just think it's, um, it's, it's compounded on many levels. Sorry, a quick comment. Um, what we have in common with Trump voters is a perspective on class, not race. And to take that web of interrelated things, what um, uh, universities and schools might have uh, as a, a perspective rather than on admissions policies, rather than be race or ethnicity based, would be class based. And class is, you know, for all the difficulties of trying to get a message to Trump supporters who are locked into Fox television, it starts with how we conceive of vulnerable populations. And it just seems to me that it's so much more powerful and unifying to do the un-American thing of conceiving of vulnerable populations by class rather than by ethnicity or race. That it feels like a very powerful communications tool for unifying and reaching out across these political divides. Yeah, so I'm I just think wondering how you think there, about that. There, Powell, Powell and others have advocated this notion. Um, we are currently being funded by uh, the California Endowment uh, to, to do an analysis looking at this phenomenon with white mortality rates. But the, uh, the person at the California Endowment who's uh, behind us doing this is Tony Eiten, who many of you may know um, has a very strong passion to deal with racial and ethnic injustice. But there's a belief, as you have said, that helping the public to understand this in a way that um, might feel more palatable to them uh, would, it was sort of a backdoor way of helping them to understand these issues. The fact of the matter is, the science tells us that class explains a large part of what uh, people of color experience, but it doesn't explain the totality of it. 
So there is the additional role of racial and ethnic discrimination. Um, after you adjust for education and income and all of that, there's still this additional uh, premium in health and other conditions that uh, 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 people of color have experienced uh, because of the history of, of how they've been treated that is apart from class. But I agree with you that class accounts for a big part of it.